Amen. Before I get serious, let me go ahead and say, Go Jaguars! Come on, don't you tell me at the beginning of the season you thought we'd be in the AFC Championship game. <laughs> there is a God somewhere. <laughs> God lives in Jacksonville. We know that now. It is official. It is official, man. We welcome you out. So glad to have you worshiping with us here today. And I put your hands together for our Orlando campus that's locked in with us this morning. And Glad to have them in our online community as well. And uh, we mentioned earlier, but we like to ask, I'm asking all of our high school parents, uh, parents of our high school uh, 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 teenagers to meet our, our student pastor and our outer court one right after service, just for a few minutes. Got a few things I've asked him to share with you that I believe will benefit you and be a blessing to you as well. And then also this uh, Saturday is our vision meeting. Every year we take time to do a vision meeting uh, for those that serve on our dream team. So if you serve in any capacity in any one of our dream teams, we ask you to come out and join us. Dream team, small group leaders, you're all a part of our, 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 our serve teams. And we ask you to come out this Saturday, uh, 930. In fact, come for prayer before that. But certainly be here for, at 930 for our dream team vision meeting. I'm going to share some things with you. We actually got something really different than what we've ever done. It's going to be extremely exciting. So we encourage you to come out. Make sure you make your way out here this Saturday for our vision meeting for our dream teamers. And then also this uh, next, next Sunday, our next small group semester begins. And I want to really challenge you and encourage you. Get plugged into small group. Our, our goal is eventually we'll get to the place we have 100 plus participation percent participation in small groups, which means everybody plugged in in some capacity, whether you're leading a small group or attending a small group. You know, during our 21 days of prayer, we've been in here praying every Monday, every Monday through Saturday, and I've been praying over these prayer cards for people that have submitted prayer cards. I cannot tell you how many cards I've picked up, and the prayer request is, God, I want to grow more. Lord, help me to overcome this addiction. Lord, help me to get free from this over here. And one of the, the, the primary purposes behind small groups is not just to have a bunch of people gather together at a home or restaurant. We really believe that it's through small groups and through our Celebrate Recovery and our Counseling Center that you find freedom. And how many know God didn't want us just to exist? He wants us to be free. Yeah. Come on, he doesn't want us just out of Egypt. He wants to get Egypt out of us too. And every single one of us, I don't care who you are, all of us have a little bit of Egypt that still tries to creep up and, and, and hang out. And the best way to get that liberty, get that freedom is not trying to do it by yourself. And it's not even just through Sunday morning church services. The best way that you find that liberty taking place and kicking into your life is when you get in community, get around some other like-minded believers who can help strengthen and encourage one another. So I want to encourage everybody, make, make plans this semester to get involved in a small group. And I'm asking a ton of you, if you haven't already made a commitment to lead a small group, take, take whatever you're doing in your life right now. If you already got a group that, that meets for breakfast on Tuesdays or you already got a group that hangs out and plays golf on Saturday, take that and let us help you turn that into your ministry. Turn that into your group where you can use an opportunity to let God use you to minister to the needs of those other people. You'd be amazed to see how God can use you because he's got something special he wants to do through you too. Shout amen, somebody. All right, we are in week number three of our series, Dialed In. And my heart for this is that as we get into the, the thick of this year, that God is going to use this season to help get you with, with a better Wi-Fi connection. God, you know, God got some things he wants to download into your spirit, not just once or twice a year. God wants to have you with a solid, you know, 10-bar Wi-Fi connection so that every day of your life you're locked into him, you're dialed in, and able to sense what he's saying. And I want to just tell you that it takes some, some work and then it takes some practice to stay locked in and dialed in to the voice of God. We use as our, as our text verse over in 1 Samuel how when young Samuel was uh, trying to hear from God or he, he's having these, these encounters with God, he was sleeping and God is calling his name and he kept jumping up running over to the prophet Eli because he thought Eli was calling him. He did it three times and finally the third time Eli said, hang on, it's not me calling you, it's God calling you. Next time he calls, Eli said, just say this, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And I love that because what God is saying to us is it's okay to have somebody who may have a little bit more experience than you in how to hear from God to be able to turn around and teach you how to get dialed in even more. Come on, shout amen, somebody. And that's all Eli did for Samuel. And, 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 I, and I believe that's my assignment over these few weeks is to take those of you, some that have never known how to hear from God, some of you that have been hearing from God all of your life, and help us to get more fine-tuned to recognize when God is talking to us. And I want to stress this again. In this year and in the time that we live right now, it is imperative that we know how to get locked into God's voice. There are a lot of voices that will be speaking to us. 
There are a lot of distractions that will be coming our way, and the difference between life and death and blessing and cursing and victory and defeat could absolutely be listening to that still, small voice that tells you which direction to go. And I believe that God's going to use this time to get you even more locked in than you've ever been before. Now, I want to take the time today to really kind of help you to understand this relationship between the, the shepherd and the sheep. And I think it's important because, you know, throughout the, the, the book of John, especially in John chapter 10, Jesus used this analogy as he's talking about us hearing from God. And he's using this parallel between the shepherd and the sheep. In fact, when you, when you, when you look at what, what he said in John chapter 10, verse 14, he said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. He says, I'm the good shepherd, I'm known by my sheep, and I'm, I, I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. Then in verse 27, he said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Again, he's using this reference of the shepherd and the sheep. Then in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, he says this. He says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered. Watch this. Like sheep having no what? Come on, I can't hear you. Like sheep having no what? Like sheep having no shepherd. Notice over and over again, Jesus is using this parallel between God and his people being the same similarity of a shepherd and his sheep. And in fact, even over in the book of, 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 of 1 Peter, when Peter is instructing the elders, he said to the elders of the church, he said, feed the flock of God, which you have oversight over. In other words, all, over and over, God is using this parallel of God being the great shepherd and we being the sheep. Now, I mean, I don't know about you, but I have to ask myself, why does God use the parallel of a shepherd and sheep? I mean, if it was me, I'd probably say the lion and the lion tamer. Or the bear and the bear tamer. I mean, there's probably some other images I would use. Maybe a, 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 an eagle or, or maybe a, a bear or a lion. But God uses this imagery of a shepherd being him and the sheep being us. And I don't know about you, but when I, when I think of, you know, kind of who I am, I, I don't think of myself as a little you know, baby sheep. I mean, at least I know most guys are not going to say, you know, I'm a sheep. In fact, you know, when you're playing Christian schools, we have a, a, a private Christian school and and uh, we have a basketball program, and, and our basketball program is doing, is doing a, a great job this year. And, and our, we are the Impact Christian Academy Lions. Yeah. And we go out and play other schools. You know, you play other Christian schools. We play Christian schools that are warriors. We play other Christian schools that are also the Lions. You play a ton of Christian schools that are the Eagles. In fact, a whole lot of Christian games are the Eagles versus the Eagles. <laughs> In all these years, I've never heard us play a Christian school that we are the, you know, Massachusetts sheep. Nobody seems to pick the sheep as their mascot, although in Scripture, God continually parallels his relationship with us as that of a shepherd interacting with his sheep. And I want to give you something today because I believe that the ability to recognize why God needs us to see ourselves as sheep and him as our shepherd is one of the master keys to not only being dialed into his voice, I believe it's the master key to having God be able to give you the provision that he really desires to give you. So many times we haven't gotten in position to really be the sheep that he des desires for us to be. And consequently, God is trying to get stuff to us, and we're busy trying to be co-shepherds. <laughs> Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. We're busy trying to be co-shepherds, trying to help him figure this out. When what he really wants to do is let him be the shepherd, let us be the sheep, and let him do what he's extremely good at, and that is taking care of his sheep. Shout amen, somebody. Now, I want to give you this from two vantage points. The first one I want to give you is from the vantage point of the sheep. The vantage point of the sheep is this. The sheep learns to live in total dependence on the shepherd. The sheep learns to live in total dependence on the shepherd. He trusts the shepherd for direction, for protection, for provision, and has no backup plan to save himself. It's going to set somebody free in here today. God looks at us as the shepherd and the sheep. And from the vantage point of the sheep, that's us looking up to God. When you look at a, a shepherd with his sheep out in Palestine or out in, in Israel, out there in the hill country, one of the things we know about the, the sheep is that the sheep learns to live in total dependence on the shepherd. The sheep has to trust the shepherd for his direction, his protection, 
provision, and the sheep has no backup plan whatsoever to save himself. In other words, if the shepherd doesn't come through, the sheep is in trouble. Amen. Amen. Turn over to Psalm 62. Psalm number 62. I'm going to read this from the Good News Translation, but you can follow along in whatever translation you have. Or if you look at our screens, we'll, we'll have it there on the screens. Psalm 62, beginning at verse number 5. Watch this. David is writing, and he says, I depend on God alone. I put my hope in him. He alone protects and saves me. He is my defender, and I shall never be defeated. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my strong protector. He is my shelter. Now, I want you to listen to this again. David stops and he says, I depend on God alone, which means I'm not depending on my bank account. Come on, I'm not depending on my job as my source. Come on, I'm not depending on my family to make sure they step in to take care of me. David said, I depend on God alone. I put my hope in him. He alone is the one who protects me and saves me. He is my defender. I should never be defeated. He's my salvation and my honor. It depends on God. He's my strong protector and my shelter. Then in verse 8, he says, trust in God at all times, my people. Tell God all of your troubles instead of posting it on your social media. I'm sorry. I just added that. It wasn't in the... Come on, I mean, is this what the Bible says? Tell God about all your troubles. Huh? Tell God about all your troubles. You know, God doesn't get weary with you talking about what your issue is. In fact, he knows what the issue is already. And what he's waiting on us to do is get to the place where we stop looking around for somebody else to tell our troubles to or somebody else to try to fix our situation, and we become sheep that are totally dependent on our shepherd. Tell him all of your troubles, for he is our refuge. Human beings are like a puff of breath. Great and small are like are worthless. Now, what he's really saying is if you're depending on human beings, they're like a puff of breath. They're here today and can be gone tomorrow, which means you can't have all your confidence wrapped up in some other human being. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. How many people end up in trouble because they had all their confidence in this person's going to work this out? This person's got my back. This person said they'll never leave me. Thank God, I believe we ought to have trust in relationships. But one thing I think we've all come to recognize over the course of life, the one person you can really trust in is God Almighty. Come on, somebody. The one person you can anchor in, the one person you can stay solid in, the one person you don't have to have any walls up with is God Almighty. Human beings, he said, are like a puff of breath. Great and small are worthless. Put them on the scales, and they weigh nothing. They are lighter than a mere breath. Don't put your trust in violence. Don't hope to gain anything by robbery. Even if your riches increase, he says, don't even depend on them. He said, even if you get a lot of money that shows up, don't put your trust in that money. Come on, don't put your trust in your 401k plan. Come on, don't put your trust in your 403b plan. Don't put your trust in your bank account or your savings. Even if you got a lot of money sitting in the bank, he said, the attitude we got to have is, as sheep, is we have total dependence on the shepherd. Which means everything about our lives, the only direction we get or the only victory we can expect is victory that comes from God Almighty. Now, how do we get then direction from our shepherd? Because if he is our shepherd and we're supposed to be totally dependent upon him for our substance, for our protection, how do we get instructions from him? And I think that's really the big question. I mean, I want to follow God. I want to be obedient to him. But how do I know when he's talking to me? Well, first and foremost, we recognize that the primary way that God speaks to us is through his word. I think that's imperative that we recognize that. The primary way that God speaks to us is through the Bible, which is why we have to spend time in God's word. I like to say it this way. The Bible is the, is the language of God. And the more time we spend in the Bible, reading the Bible, reading the Bible and studying the Bible, it's two different things. You know, every believer should have some type of Bible reading plan. Where if, you just, if you're reading through the Bible, and there's a number, number of them on version and other places where you can just have scriptures every day that will give you to read through the Bible. So you can read through the Bible in a year. If it takes you more than a year, just keep reading through the Bible. And then we ought to have some times where we take time to study the Bible. You say, if you don't, how, how do I study the Bible? Get plugged into one of our small groups. We have small groups that are specifically designed to help new believers to get anchored in the faith and will teach you how to study the Bible. 
But it's important that we have a routine where we're putting the word in our hearts because the Bible is the language of heaven. And if you want to hear what God is saying, he speaks Bible talk. And I mean, it's not enough to have read the Bible before. You have to stay current with it. I mean, some of you took four years of Spanish and you don't know any more than I knew. Come on, somebody. Well, it's not enough to have read it or have studied it, have spent some time with it at one time. You've got to stay locked in and current with it if you want to be able to make sure that you're locked in and hearing that language when it's being spoken. God speaks the Bible. So the first thing we got to do, if we want to stay locked into the voice of the shepherds, we got to make sure that we are having a good diet of the Word of God because God will never say anything to us that is different than what He's already written in His Word. That's one of, one of the ways you can judge what somebody is telling you. If they're telling you something that the Lord told them, but it is different than what he said in the Word, that's not God. I don't, care what, I don't care who they are. I don't care what title they have in front of their name, how many doctorates they have, or how many churches they have, or how many people are in their churches. If I stand up here and tell you something that is different than this Bible, you can love me and still say, that is wrong. Because at the end of the day, God is not going to say anything to you or to me that is going to be different than what he wrote in this love letter he gave us years ago. Come on, shout amen, somebody. That's why you ought to treasure this word, put this word in your heart. Huh? That's why the Bible says study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that doesn't have to be ashamed and can rightly divide the word of truth, which means when I'm hearing something, I can discern if that is God or not based on if it is in line with or violating the word of God. But then beyond that, how do we know when God is talking to us when it's not something that's specifically written in the word? How do I know if I should take this job or that job? How do I know if I should buy this red car or this blue car over here? Should I just go based on what I really want? Or is one of those the will of God? Or maybe neither one of those is the will of God? How do I know how to recognize? Isn't that what the real question becomes? How do I know what God is saying? Because if I can learn how to get locked into his voice and do what he's telling me to do, I'm going to have victory in everything I put in my hands to do. Because a good shepherd is going to lead me to pastures of plenty. A good shepherd is going to make sure that I'm protected and provided for. But as the sheep, I've got to be dependent upon him, and I've got to be listening to his voice. So do we hear God's voice speaking to us in an audible voice like you hear me right now? I'll tell you, it's possible to hear, hear God speak to you that way. In my, in my life as, as a believer, and I've been a, a pastor now for be 22 years this year, been in, been in ministry this, this Wednesday, I believe it will be. Yeah, this Wednesday will be 25 years from the day I preached my first sermon. This Wednesday, January 24th, will be 25 years, and I preached a sermon in 1993. I was a little really, really skinny kid. <laughs> preached a sermon called Living on the Rock of Obedience from Luke chapter 6. How is it that you call me Lord and Lord and don't do a thing that I'm telling you to do? Well, 25 years I've been in ministry and in these 25 years of ministry and the years prior to that being saved, I've only heard God speak in what I believe was an audible voice one time. That was when I was working for General Motors. I was a mechanical engineering student working for General Motors. And uh, I was, at this time, had an assignment up in Flint, Michigan. And so during the week, I lived up in Flint, Michigan, in an apartment up there working for General Motors as an a, uh, engineer, helping to design cars up there. But my girlfriend at the time, April, was back home in Detroit. And so on the weekends, I'd drive home to Detroit at, uh, stay at my mom's house, and we'd hang out on the weekend. Then uh, on Sunday night or Monday, head back to, to Flint so I can be there for work. Well, this particular week, I'm heading back early Monday morning, and I'm driving, and I have just learned about praise and worship. And so I'm worshiping God in the cars I'm driving. You ever been worshiping God and just kind of get caught up while you're worshiping? You know what I mean? Caught up in, you know, your, your, your eyes. You just got to make sure you keep your eyes on the road. And, and I'm driving on my way back up to Flint, and I could have sworn I heard somebody in the back seat say, you are to be a minister. So much so to where I, it, it kind of pulled me out of my worship, and I turned around and looked back because I know I was the only one who got in the car. <laughs> and I turned around and looked back, and there's nobody. But to this day, you cannot tell me that I didn't hear an audible voice. Now, it might have just been so loud in my spirit that I thought I heard it audibly. But the only time I can say I believe I heard the audible voice of God was at one time when the, when the Lord spoke to me and said, you are to be a minister. The majority of the time, the way in which we hear from God is not with an audible voice that your natural ear is going to hear. The majority of the time, and I need you to get this, is with what we call the inward witness. The inward witness. And this is huge for you to grab hold of this right here. 
Many Christians erroneously look to outward circumstances instead of the inward witness to give them direction. This is where most believers right here, when they miss it, they miss it on this point. Because they're looking for something on the outside to tell them, is this the will of God? Kind of like Gideon. Gideon was a, 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 a warrior. Gideon was a prophet. Gideon was a judge. And God sent the angel of the Lord to Gideon and said to him, you mighty man of valor, I'm getting ready to use you to do some great things. And Gideon pretty much said, well, how do I know this is going to really come to pass? Where are all the miracles that we used to see? And so the angel said to him, you know, Gideon said, I'm going to go and prepare some food for you. Gideon went in and prepared some, some, some meat for the angel, prepared some bread and prepared some soup. And he brought it back out. The angel said, pour the soup out. He said, put the, the meat and the bread on this rock. The angel took his staff that he had, touched the rock, and a fire consumed the, the food. And Gideon then said, okay, now I know this must be an angel of God. But then that wasn't enough because then God comes behind that and God says to Gideon, okay, I'm getting ready to use you to do a great battle, win a great battle against these Midianites. And Gideon says, well, how do I know you're going to really do this? And so Gideon says, well, 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 well bear with me, God. I'm going to put this fleece of wool out on the ground. And tomorrow morning when I wake up, if it's really you talking to me, God, I want there to be dew on the blanket, but no dew on the ground around me. Next morning he gets up. The blanket is soaked with dew. He takes it and wrings it out. You would think that would be enough. He said, all right, I need, I need one, more, one more sign, God. Come on, some of you laughing because some of you have been stuck in the same spot right here. I need one more sign, God. I'm going to put the blanket back out tomorrow morning, God. And if it's really you talking to me, I want there to be dew on everything else but no dew on the blanket. Gets up the next morning. There's dew on all the ground, but there's no dew on top of the blanket. Well, God was patient with Gideon to let Gideon go through that. Because Gideon didn't have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of him. God doesn't lead us. Come on, somebody. God doesn't lead us that way today. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. God doesn't lead us that way. And it's dangerous to get caught up in looking for some external sign. God doesn't lead us. You know, God doesn't, doesn't allow us to say, well, Lord, if you want me to take this job, then let them offer me 30% more than I'm making right now. They might offer you 40% more. That doesn't mean it's God. They might offer you 10% less than you're making right now, and it might be God. I'm preaching real good. You can't say stuff to God like, well, Lord, if, if this is the guy you want me to be with, then uh, when, I'm, when I meet his mama, let, let her have a French and Indian weave and <laughs> lace fronts and <laughs> let her eyelashes. You, you can't give God some external stuff. Hmm? Well, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Whatever we get, whatever we get, it's got to be on the inside. Because now that you are born again, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things became new. Right now on the inside of you, you've got God, the Holy Spirit, living on the inside of you. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, even if you are not spirit-filled and praying in tongues at this point yet, if you have accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, you have the Holy Spirit. You don't have any less Holy Spirit than I have or any other preacher has. You've got the same Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. And if you've got God living on the inside of you, then watch this. God knows how to speak to you from the inside out. And I think what happens so many times is that we get so accustomed to hearing people say, the Lord said to me. And I think it confuses our minds at times about how to really listen to God. We are led by the inward witness. Or I want to introduce you to a phrase, inward pr impressions from God. Inward impressions from God. Listen to this. Many times the phrase, the Lord told me or the Lord spoke to me, paralyzes people from being able to recognize God's direction because they are waiting for every communication from God to come in the form of a sentence, a command, or an explicit directive like one would receive from their earthly parent. Instead, God most often speaks to our spirits not in words, but in thoughts and impressions. Then our spirits speak to us in words like, I think the Lord wants me to do this or do that. Many times we miss the leading of the Lord by mistaking it for being our own thoughts. Man, that's good stuff right there. So many times we're waiting on the Lord to speak to us, thou art to go and do this. And then we're waiting on him to speak to us in King James language. Thou art to do this or thou art to do that. Well, many times God is speaking to our spirit with thoughts or impressions 
And our heart just kind of speaks to us. You know, I, I think God wants me to do this. I, I'm, I'm really feeling led that I should do that. Remember years ago, man, I, I was sitting at my computer at, at home just working. And uh, I just got this sense that, that go, go upstairs and pull up, uh, up Nextel stock. Back, remember Nextel back in the day? You know, he had a little phone, chirp, chirp. Well, I went upstairs and pulled up Nextel stock, and I think Nextel was trading at that time for $2.30 a share. And I can't say that I had a voice that spoke to me and said, thou art to buy Nextel stock, but I had an impression on the inside. Go and buy some of this stuff. Well, I got busy that day and got busy doing something, didn't do it. Got busy the next day and didn't do it. A few days went by. I think two weeks went by, hadn't done it. I looked back up, and I think it was trading at that time for $5 and something a share. And if you understand how, how stocks work, if I had just put $10,000 in bought stock that day, I'd have made, you know, uh, extra $10,000, $15,000 in, in a matter of a couple of weeks. I looked up uh, 20, and so then I figured I, I blew it. I missed it. I looked up two years later, that same Nextel stock was trading for $30 and something a share. I've been kicking myself for a long time. <laughs> because remember, here, here's a phrase, something told me. So how many times does something tell us and we wrestle with it because it doesn't come in some spiritual package? Nobody's shaking or, or, or moving when, they, when, when we hear the impression. Sometimes it's just that inward knowing in your knower, you know, something told me I should go to this store over here today. Something is impressing upon me that I should stop at this gas station today. Something is telling me, don't stop at that spot you normally stop at. Drive past it. Drive two miles past your house and go to the store over there. But our, if we don't watch it, our heads will talk us out of it. Because our head says, I ain't about to spend that much money in gas driving all the way over there. But all along, it could be the Holy Spirit impressing upon your heart. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Jesus said it clearly, my sheep hear my voice. You hear his voice. He's talking to you right now. He's talking to you every single day. But what we've got to learn how to do is learn how to take those little practice quiz tests where we say yes to the little bitty things. And then when the big thing shows up, like what happened in, you know, 2001 World Trade Center. There, there's story after story of people that were on their way to work that day in the, in the World Towers. And something told them. Stop and get some ice cream first. Stop and grab a coffee over here first. That little impression, come on, somebody, could be the very thing that saves your life. Come on. Could be the very thing that walks you into the biggest blessing you've ever experienced in your life, which is why we got to get dialed in and learn how to fine-tune our spirit to hear what God is saying. Shout amen, somebody. Amen. Turn to 1 Samuel 28. First Samuel chapter 28, look at verse number 4. It says, Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, <clears throat> and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. He didn't answer him by dreams, which is one of the ways he would speak to, to Saul. He didn't answer him by the Urim, which was a, a, almost like a dice-like device that the, the high priest would wear in, in, their, in their robe. He didn't answer him by the Urim or Thummim, and he didn't answer him by the prophets, which means Saul hadn't gotten to a place where God was done talking to him. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Well, now, what is a medium? Today, we call it a fortune teller, a palm reader. And in Saul's case, because he didn't have the Holy Spirit within him, God was using external stuff to lead him, but he wasn't using mediums to lead him. God would use this device, as I said, called the Urim that the high priest would wear in his breastplate. And when the, when the king needed to hear a word from God, he called the prophets to inquire of them, or he, God would speak to him in a dream, or he called the high priest and he'd pull out this Urim and Thummim, these two devices that most scholars think were similar to a, a pair of dice. And they'd ask a question and boom, they'd throw them out and that would reveal the answer from God. That was acceptable back then because he didn't have the Holy Spirit on the inside. 
When that didn't work, though, I want you to see what he did. He went and said, find me a medium, find me a fortune teller, find me a, a, a woman who can read tarot cards or poems. And he went looking for an answer there. Can I tell you that as born-again believers, God doesn't need you going looking at anybody else for your answers. I want to make this real clear. Born-again believers have no business going to fortune tellers. Come on, we have no business at tarot card readers or palm readers. I'm going to hit you in the gut with this one. You don't even need to look at your horoscope in the morning. It's not going to send you to hell. It's not demonic to that degree. But why? You, you don't need to read to see what all the Pisces are doing. Some of y'all done hooked up with somebody because your horoscope told you that a Pisces and a Libra go well together. And y'all been fighting for 15 years. Come on, somebody. God is the one who's got your answers. Come on, say amen. Well, we can't look for stuff on the outside to give us answers from a God who is supernatural on the inside. Every answer you need is already on the inside of you. God just needs you to slow down long enough to come into his presence and let him speak to your heart. As New Testament believers with the Holy Spirit within us, it's dangerous for us to consult any external means for our answers. Satan's got access to this physical realm, and he can use something to trip you up. You remember when in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus had been fasting for 40 days, Satan came and tempted him and said, if you're the son of man, command these stones to be made bread. Then at one point, he takes him up to this high pinnacle, and he shows him, the Bible says, all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, I'll give you authority over all of this stuff if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now, if, you, if we're just going based on open doors, that was an open door. I'll let you have authority over all this stuff. Can, can I tell you, many times Satan brings opportunities our way, disguised as promotions that are going to get us away from the Word of God. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Can I just tell you, God is not going to give you a promotion that's going to make you not be able to come to church and worship him. That's like me. You think I'm going to bless my wife with a, with a, with a, with a, a car or a diamond ring that, make, that keeps her from coming home and sleeping with me? You better be kidding I'm not going to bless her with anything that's going to keep her from being with me. Huh? If I'm giving her anything, it's going to make it easier for her to get closer to me. We understand that in the natural. Why would we think that God's going to bless us with a job that makes us work every single Sunday morning and we never get a chance to come and spend time with him? Never get a chance to worship with other believers. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Sometimes the thing that looks like an opportunity, it is an opportunity, but it's an opportunity to get further away from God. And we got to have our eyes wide open and have our priorities so locked in that anything that God is bringing my way, it's going to be something that pulls me closer to him, not gives me an opportunity to get further away. Thank you, Lord. Listen to this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, The peace that Christ gives us is to guide you in the decisions you make. For it is to this peace that God has called you together in one body and be thankful. The Amplified Bible says it's that peace that becomes your umpire. How do I know when is God talking to me? Well, you spend, if we spend enough time praying, especially if you spend time praying in the Holy Spirit, whatever the choices are that are sitting in front of you, if you spend enough time praying so you can quiet down all the other voices around, one, one choice will start to rise to the top and you will have peace over that choice. Most of the time, that doesn't happen quickly. It happens because we spend enough time in the presence of God that we can quiet out all the other voices. What other voices do we need to quiet out? we got to quiet out the voice of our intellect. That's the voice that says it doesn't make sense to me. Just because it doesn't make sense to me doesn't mean it's not God. Hmm? It didn't make sense to me for me to quit my, 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 my job at General Motors and drop out of school at Michigan State to go home to go to an unaccredited Bible school. But that's what God had me doing because he was preparing me for ministry. It didn't make sense to me in, in 1992, at the end of 92, after April had told me no two times to marry her because I didn't have a job. Now God comes along, and I start sensing God saying, I want you all to get married in 93. I finally said, I'm not going to bring up the subject again until God says so. In the 92, I start sensing God wants us to get married next year. And I bring it to her, and she goes in prayer, and she comes back and says, I think he is saying that. Well, I knew there had to be something, something going on then. Hmm? Well, every time we start talking about it, think, rationalizing, we would talk ourselves out of it because it didn't make sense. I'm in Bible school, getting ready to graduate Bible school, trying to figure out where I'm, where I'm going from there. Do I go back to Michigan State? 
So what do we do? In the multitude of counselors, there's safety. We went to our pastor and submitted what we were thinking to our pastor. We said, it's not making sense to our head, but it seems like the Lord is talking to us about getting married next year. He said, yep, that's exactly what God is saying. Because when you graduate next year, I'm going to bring you on staff full time as a part of our staff. But God was telling us something to get ready for something coming up next year. There's no way we would have known that unless we were willing to take what we thought we were hearing, get past our intellect, and submit it to some leadership that can give us some wisdom on it. Come on, shout amen, somebody. We've got to quiet the voice of our desires. That's the voice that says, I don't really want to do it that way. Just because we don't want to do it doesn't mean it's not God talking to us. There's many things that God will tell us to do that may not be convenient. God is speaking to some of you about being small group leaders, but it's not convenient. It's going to require you to have to stretch yourself or sacrifice some time. Just because it's not convenient doesn't mean it's not God. In fact, say it out loud. Just because it's not convenient. Come on, say it like you mean it. Just because it's not convenient doesn't mean it's not God. God will sometimes require us to do some stuff that we don't feel like doing. We've got to quiet the voice of our feelings. That's the one that just says, I'm just not feeling it. And we've got to quiet the voice of popularity. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's God. Hmm? Wide is the road, the Bible says, that leads to death and destruction. There's a lot of folks that find that one. Narrow is the road that leads to life and peace. The Bible says only a few that find it. We got to raise our kids and not get their affirmation from all the people that click like on their little pictures and everything. Hmm? We got to raise our children. Get your affirmation from God. You're something because God says you are. You're something because your parents are speaking life into you. Raise our children that way so they don't get addicted to having to get affirmation from everybody else because just because it's popular doesn't mean that it's God. Come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. Write this down. The good shepherd accepts total responsibility for the sheep. He leads the sheep into pathways of provision, protection, increase, growth, favor, and blessing. Man, that's good. The good shepherd accepts total responsibility for the sheep. So we have to learn to be totally dependent on him. And then the good shepherd accepts total responsibility for us as a sheep. Our God is the good shepherd, and he knows how to take care of his own. God will provide for us in every single circumstance if we'll learn how to trust him and listen to his voice. That's why the Bible tells us in Psalm number 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I what? Come on, the Lord is my shepherd, I what? Come on, if the Lord is my shepherd, that means I'm not going to be in lack. He's going to take care of me. He makes me lie down in what kind of pastures? He leads me beside what kind of waters? He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they do what? You prepare a table before me where? Right in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup does what? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When the Lord is our shepherd, the Bible says we won't end up in lack and want. That's not just money. You won't, you won't want for love. The Lord will lead you to friendships you can count on. The Lord will lead you to people that will be loyal to you in your life and, and support you. The Lord will lead you to relationships where you can flourish and, and allow you to just be who you are. Come on, say amen, somebody. The Lord will lead you to financial increase. The Lord will lead you into divine health. I'm speaking to somebody in here right now. 21 days of fasting has not been your time just to push your plate to the side, push some sweets to the side, and then dive back in to everything you've been eating when this is up. The reason why the Lord gave us permission for everybody to let him tell you what to give up is because for some of you, he's having you give up some stuff that he's not going to let you pick back up. Because the good shepherd, watch this, will lead you around cancer before it shows up. The good shepherd will help you avoid that heart attack because he can see what doctors can't see going on in the arteries. 
A good shepherd is the one that will tell you, I want you to get up and start exercising. You don't have to run a marathon, but I want you to get up and start moving, stirring these waters up. He's not doing it just for weight loss for you to look good and post pictures. He's doing it because he's the good shepherd. He knows what the enemy will try to do. And a good shepherd will make sure his protective nature is that he gets you totally away from the lie that the devil's trying to bring your way. But it happens because we're willing to listen to him. Come on, lift your hands. Thank you, Lord, for being a good shepherd. Come on, thank you, Lord, for helping us to hear. We know your voice. The voice of a stranger we will not follow. We are submitted to you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Come on, let's thank the Lord for speaking to us right now. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us about what school to put our children in. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us about how to handle our money. Thank you for speaking to us about which job to take. It's not about the pay. It's about being where you want us to be, Lord. Come on, we thank you, Father. You're fine-tuning our hearing. We know your voice and the voice of a stranger. We will not follow. Oh, thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Come on, thank the Lord that he is speaking to you. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Thank you, Lord, your voice is clear to us. Thank you, Lord God. We know what to do concerning our marriage. We know what to do concerning our children. We won't let pressure, peer pressure, any of those things, Lord God, push us to a place that you haven't told us to go. We thank you in Jesus' name. Now every head is bowed, every eye is closed in prayer, please. No one's moving or walking. I'm a little bit over my time, so I need you to listen closely right here. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, here in Jacksonville, there in Orlando, those in our overflow rooms and those online as well, I'm, I'm speaking to you as well. If you listen to me right now and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord, well, let me make it even more plain. If you were to walk out of this place today and breathe your last breath, do you know where you'd go? If you cannot say with 100% certainty and clarity that you go to heaven to be with the Lord, let me tell you right now, the Good Shepherd is speaking to you. The Good Shepherd is, is priming your heart right now, giving you an opportunity right now to recognize I'm the one talking to you. I'm the one that's trying to save your life. I'm the one that loves you so much that I sent my son to die in your place. So right now, if that's you, you're not saved, you're not 100% sure that you're saved, and today you're ready to give your heart to Jesus Christ, you don't have to be perfect. You don't even have to have everything together in your life. In fact, you might think you're a complete mess. God specializes in taking those of us that have been a complete mess and turning our lives around. But it requires you to take that step and say yes to Jesus Christ. So if you're here today, you're not saved, and you're ready to make that commitment to Jesus Christ, would you let me pray for you today? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come here to the front of the sanctuary. Right there where you're sitting, I want to pray a simple prayer that will change your life forever if you give me a chance to do so. So if you're here and you say, yes, pastor, include me in on this prayer, then let me know right now that I'm praying for you by lifting up your hand right there where you're sitting. Come lift up right there where you are. Thank you. See that hand right there? Who else today? Thank you. Another hand right there. Come on, who else? Thank you. Another hand right there. Thank you. Another hand right there. Come on, who else? Who else? Anyone else? Those online. Those in Orlando. Come on, if something on the inside is telling you that you need to get in on this prayer, I just told you who that is. That's the Holy Spirit. The devil's not going to tell you to raise your hand right now. Thank you. See that hand? He's going to tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't raise your hand. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Thank you. See that hand right there? Go ahead and just say yes to him and shoot your hand up before you have a chance to talk yourself out of it. Thank you. See that hand there in the back? Who else today? Thank you. Another hand right there. Thank you. Another hand right there. Come on, anyone else? Thank you, ma'am. Another hand there. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I want to ask every one of you that raised your hand for prayer to pray this prayer out loud with me. The rest of the believers in here, go ahead and begin praying softly right there at your seat. Every one of you that raised your hand for prayer, pray this prayer just loud enough for you and God to hear. God's going to change your life right there where you're sitting. Say this out loud. Say, Dear God in heaven, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is your son. I believe he died for me. He paid the price for my sin. I believe you raised him from the dead. And he's alive right now. So I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my heart now. Save me now. I turn my back on the ways of the world. And I choose today to follow you, Jesus, with all of my heart. And according to the Bible, I am right now born again. Amen. Go ahead and put your hands together. Help us celebrate with these men and women. Come on, help us celebrate with these men and women. Praise God. 
want to say congratulations to each of you that raised your hand and, and prayed that prayer along with me. For those of you in the auditorium here, there's a card. We mentioned it earlier. It's in the seat pocket right there in front of you. We call it a connection card. looks like this. If you raise your hand and pray that prayer along with us today, would you fill that card out for us? It's just got some basic information. We're not going to call or harass you. We want to send you a letter just to give you some next steps. You made the most important decision you could ever make in life. Now we want to give you some next steps so that you know what to do now that you made this most important decision. If you're online watching us online, there's a little button right there on your screen. You can click as well to be able to complete one of these digitally. And we'll be glad to send you that information out as well. One of the first things I want to encourage you to do is get plugged into a good church right away. If you believe this is the right one, you can get plugged in here at Impact Church. We have growth track classes today. See one of our ushers. They'll be glad to give you information about that. And then get baptized as soon as you can. All of our baptism happened on the first Sunday of the month after each of our services. And we would love to baptize you at the first Sunday in the month of February. One more time, put your hands together and congratulate these men and women.